the opening lecture. I just wanted to uh, say a few words about Derek Bell and about you know how this whole thing got started. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so Derek Bell. He was uh, born in uh, November of 1930 here in Pittsburgh in the Hill District. Uh, he was the first person in his family to go to college. Uh, he attended Duquesne University. Uh, he served as a lieutenant in the United States Air Force. And uh, after completing his service, uh, he enrolled here at uh, Pitt Law. Uh, he was the only black student in his class of 140 students, and he was one of only three black students in the entire school at the time. Uh, however, despite that, you know, he was not only a, a member of our Law Review, but he served as the Associate Editor-in-Chief of, of the University of Pittsburgh Law Review and graduated in 1957. Uh, after graduating, uh, he served in the uh, U.S. Department of Justice in their Civil Rights Division, but he didn't serve there very long. Uh, they repeatedly requested that he uh, resign his membership in the NAACP, and rather than resign his membership in the NAACP, he decided to, uh, to uh, stop working for the Department of Justice. Uh, after that, he he went and worked for the NAACP uh, in their legal defense fund, uh, working with such luminaries as Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and he supervised more than 300 cases of uh, school desegregation in the South. Uh, after that, he joined uh, the faculty of Harvard Law School and uh, published his uh, seminal casebook, uh, Race, Racism, and American Law. Uh, it is now in its sixth edition. and. Uh, in 1980, he became dean of the University of Oregon School of Law, uh, but ended up resigning from there as well in protest after they refused to hire an Asian American female professor, who we have with us here at Pitt Law. Uh, he returned that same year to Harvard, uh, but then after years of activism around the hiring and promotion of female professors of color, uh, he took a two-year uh, unpaid leave of absence in protest. And uh, this time he was dismissed from his position at Harvard. Uh, he uh, later joined the faculty of NYU and also uh, became active again here at Pitt Law, serving as a distinguished visiting professor of law. Uh, the school has since established a Derek Bell lecture series. Uh, we've uh, dedicated uh, the fifth floor of our library to Derek Bell. And our Black Law Students Association uh, now runs a legal clinic in his name. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Derek Bell because uh, I, as an undergraduate, I encountered uh, his, his work in a class on racism in American law. We were assigned his case book, uh, Race, Racism in American Law. And you know, at the, at the time, uh, like many people, I, I held more or less a kind of classical liberal view of the relationship between race and the law. And I found his work uh, you know, very challenging, and, but also very inspiring. And uh, it, you know, was one of the factors that inspired me to go to law school. And uh, you know, when I, I found out I'd been accepted at Pitt, uh, you know, I was very excited to go to the place that Derek Bell graduated from. And you know, as I, I learned more about him and his biography, uh, you know, I was I was also inspired by by that, by his legacy of uh, you know challenging authority and uh, speaking up in protest, uh, even when. Uh, you know, it didn't make sense on a, on a personal, you know, kind of rational uh, economic incentive level. Uh, and so when, you know, when I got accepted, it, it was uh, around the same time that he tragically passed away. And uh, when I found out that I would be joining the law review that he was a part of and that we would soon be celebrating our 75th anniversary, I thought really there'd be nothing better to do to celebrate the anniversary than to celebrate the life of Derek Bell. And, uh, so I, I approached Professor Gonzalez Rose about it because I knew that she worked in the same field. And I, I was just initially thinking of something relatively small uh, because I just wasn't sure that putting together something like this would even be possible. And she encouraged me to pursue uh, the symposium that, that we have here tonight and tomorrow. And uh, it really wouldn't have been possible without, without her significant amount of support and help and without the support also of Dean Carter. And also, it definitely wouldn't have been possible without the hard work and support of all the Law Review staff, but especially Megan Block, uh, our lead executive editor. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to her. She could talk a little bit more about this. Thank 
you, Caleb. Uh, as you can tell from Professor Bell's bio, he has a lot of connections to Pittsburgh. He's a native son of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's Hill District neighborhood. He went to Pitt Law. As Caleb mentioned, he was the associate editor in chief on our law review. And this has been mentioned at least once today during the roundtable sessions, but one of my favorite stories of Professor Bell is that when he was a student, he wrote so many articles on civil rights that he was asked whether he was trying to turn the law review into the civil rights review. Um, and so I think that that is a perfect illustration of his spirit and one of many reasons that we are so excited to commemorate our 75th volume um, by celebrating and honoring Professor Bell. Uh, first, I want to thank our co-sponsors. Uh, we have several. We are so grateful for all of your support. Um, first, Dean Larry Davis and the School of Social Work here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Ralph Bangs and the Center on Race and Social Problems. Reggie Shuford um, from the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Barb Frege from the ACLU of Greater Pittsburgh. Rashad Birdsong and the Community Empowerment Association, and Shiaira Powell and the Black Law Students Association. This event would not have been possible without you, and we thank you so much. One of the things that, especially the symposium, seeing it and being here has really hit home for me is how everyone has a personal connection to Derek Bell and Derek Bell's work. Um, I was first introduced to his work while I was teaching in West Philadelphia. I was a literacy teacher, um, and one of my graduate professors assigned Silent Covenants. And wow, that was an aha moment. Um, I read the alternative Brown versus Board of Education, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly you know what I've been thinking. Um, and that moment was solidified for me by a fourth grade student, Autumn who came up to me about a week after I'd finished this book, so excited about her Black History Month poster on Brown versus Board of Education. And she was so excited because she could read it and she showed me all the pictures. And then she said, but Miss Block, I just have one question. You know, this case is about how black kids go to black schools and white kids go to white schools. And I just don't know how it's different. I read Silent Covenants again as a law student last year in Professor Gonzalez Rose's Race in the Law class. And I cannot tell you what an honor it is to introduce Professor Jasmine Gonzalez Rose. She is an associate professor here at the University of Pittsburgh, and she was our advisor for the symposium. She is a critical proceduralist. She teaches race in the law, complex litigation, and evidence, all of which I have taken. Um, I had one class with her, and I had to have them all. Um, I've also had the pleasure of working with her on her most recent research project, which is made possible through the Derek A. Bell uh, Fund for Excellence Award. So we could not have been luckier with an advisor. So it's really an honor. Thank you. It is absolutely wonderful to be here and to see all of you and to see members of the faculty and from uh, departments across the university, attorneys, wonderful students and everyone here, um, guests who have traveled to speak here and to listen here and for us to learn from each other from so far away. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing um, Dean William Carter. So Dean Carter, um, he is, specializes in constitutional law, civil rights, human rights, and he is really known as a foremost scholar on the 13th Amendment. His scholarship has been published far and wide on some of the top law reviews of the country. He's written books by prestigious presses such as Oxford University Press and Columbia University Press on the 13th Amendment. Before coming to Pitt Law, he was a professor at Temple University and prior to that at Case Western Reserve University. So more important though, I think, than all of these uh, impressive qualifications, 
I want to tell you the second installment of um, Caleb Pittman, the um, editor-in-chief of the Law Review story about how this symposium came to be. Caleb came to me and we went to Dean Carter and Dean Carter welcomed, embraced and encouraged us to have this event and it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, upstairs earlier we were talking at the round table about praxis. I think Dean Carter has uh, exemplified a sort of praxis, a praxis of applying theory into his administration. As the most junior member of this faculty, I can tell you that in every interaction with Dean Carter, I have felt empowered, encouraged, and it's just such an honor to ask him to come up here and give some remarks about this symposium. Let's welcome Dean Carter. Thank you, Jasmine. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. We are here for a celebration of the life of one of the most distinguished alumni of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and for a celebration of his scholarship to engage with others who have uh, carried the torch and furthered his legacy in many different ways. Uh, for those of you I have not met personally, I do have, hope to have the opportunity to engage with you. And uh, despite Jasmine's generous introduction, I'm going to be incredibly brief because I want to hear Ian, our distinguished keynote uh, opening speaker for this evening. I do want to share a few very brief remarks and words of thanks though um, so before going further please uh, let me thank all of you for coming and spending this time with us uh, all of our distinguished speakers who have traveled far and wide to be here for this special event uh, our talented staff you know before I became an administrator I, I thought that this stuff just happened magically uh, there is a lot of work behind the scenes by people other than me uh, that bring these things together so they have our thanks as well uh, our students uh, you know as uh, Janet and I have discussed many times, Professor Bell um, had a very simple philosophy about teaching students first. And you saw that they opened this, that they've been deeply engaged uh, with this event, and uh, I'm very proud of them, and I, I hope you all are proud of yourselves um, for all you do, um, and in particular for bringing together this dynamic event. Um, Professor Gonzalez Rose herself uh, is a tremendous colleague, uh, one of our bright shining stars, incredibly smart, incredibly well published, well known uh, even in these early stages in her career, um, but also really, really deeply embodies Professor Bell's philosophy of participatory teaching and learning. Uh, the level of engagement that her students have with her in the project of constructing their own knowledge and understanding of the law uh, is really remarkable, so that deserves some special acknowledgement as well. Uh, finally, I would like to thank, uh, as I always do, Mrs. Bell and the members of the Bell family uh, for their support of Pitt Law, their support of me, their support of our students and, and their willingness to be engaged and stay engaged um, whenever asked and however asked. Um, it's truly been uh, one of the privileges of my professional career to get to know Mrs. Bell and the rest of the Bell family. Uh, you know, I, as I said, uh, I was privileged to give the uh, Bell Lecture at NYU this fall. And as I said there, you know, uh, she's too young and I'm too old for me to think of Janet as a mother figure. Uh, I think of her as the, the elegant older sister, you know, who you want to follow around, who you want to listen to because you admire so much, um, admire her so much. So it's really been a privilege to get to know you and the other members of the family. I only have uh, very brief remarks. You've heard a lot about Professor Bell. You'll be hearing more about his fields of research and uh, his philosophy of teaching throughout the course of the symposium. Uh, as I said, I do want to get out of the way to hear our distinguished speaker, but uh, just a couple of points that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Uh, the first is that I bring you a special greeting uh, from one of Professor Bell's classmates, Governor Richard Thornburg. Could not be here with us this evening. He wanted me to extend his regards and regrets to Mrs. Bell and the family and to let all of you know that if it were not for a conflict of the highest order, he would have done everything in his power to be here. Uh, you know, it's interesting to have two graduates of that prominence in the same graduating class. And it's even more interesting to hear Governor Thornburg speak about Professor Bell. Um, even in their student days, they obviously had very different philosophies about the law and about life. But in the governor's ward, uh, although they often found themselves at, at, in heated arguments regarding policy, they were never at knife's edge. They, they were two gentlemen representative of a generation of people who knew uh, that you can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, so I want to extend his personal uh, greetings and regards to all of you and his regrets that he could not attend. 
As for me, uh, there's a lot I could tell you about uh, Professor Bell, his impact on this school, uh, his impact on this region, his impact on my career trajectory, uh, his impact on my scholarship, his impact on my colleagues here on the faculty who had the pleasure of serving with him. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to delve into all of that. I'm sure others will, will share that with you. I would like to make one simple point in two different ways. Uh, the point is this. Uh, were it not for Professor Bell, I would not be here today. And I mean that in two very specific senses. Uh, first, of course, all of us who followed in his footsteps, uh, his groundbreaking work, his courage, uh, his uh, legal work to desegregate institutions, and the simple fact that he had the temerity to be black, proud, and excellent at a time uh, when you could be two of those things, but all three was kind of dangerous, uh, was really an inspiration and a path clearing for so many of us. So when I say I would not be here, I mean I would not have had the opportunities that I have had were it not for his work. I also mean in the same sense that Caleb reflected upon that I would not be here because I would not have chosen to go to law school unless I had the opportunity to engage with Professor Bell's work. That was my first uh, window into the law. I had no relatives in my family who were lawyers, no one in my neighborhood who was lawyers, never met a lawyer. Uh, and I read this book, and we are not saved. And it just uh, really absorbed me in ways that were really profound and completely changed the course of my life. Um, so so I have him to thank for where I am now. I have the distinct pleasure of turning the floor over to our friend, our supporter, a scholar who we will be soon calling Dr. Bell as soon as her thesis dissertation committee clears uh, her thesis, as I know they will, Mrs. Janet Bell. I think of him as my academic son and for very good reason. Uh, he's already acknowledged the family. There's one member I would like to acknowledge too, and that's Derek's first wife, Jewel Bell, uh, to whom he was married for 30 years. And uh, she died of cancer before he and I met. She died during the middle of the Harvard protest, and I always lift her up, and I will do that again tonight. Dean Carter mentioned that he was the Derrick Bell lecturer last year at NYU. Uh, the lecture series was in its 19th year. There are two other Bell lecturers here I'd like to acknowledge. Richard Delgado, who, I, who really, the year he gave the lecture, which was about the eighth or ninth year, I don't remember, but really brought a level of scholarship and seriousness to the lecture series that all the lecturers have been good, but I always think of, of Richard's as a seminal lecture. Ian Haney Lopez, and you'll hear his relationship with Derek a little bit later when he talks, but Ian was the last lecturer that Derek personally selected. As it turned out, it was um, the, the lecture occurred the day before the memorial service. Derek died in October of 2011. The memorial service was in November of 2011. And Derek taught the week before he died. Derek loved to teach, and teaching kept him alive. It was just a marvelous thing with him. He always thought there was no higher calling than being a teacher, mentor. When that universal encyclopedia is open, and you open the word mentor, up pops that, that picture of Derek Bell. I want to also thank the students, the students, Caleb, Megan, you are incredible. And thank you so much for all that you've done for the idea, for pushing it forward. And of course, Professor Jasmine Gonzalez-Rose, the students speak so highly of you. And to me, in our family, it's always been students first. A couple of last things. Last year, Derek was given the highest award of the American Association of Law Schools. Not the most liberal group in the world. And they were quite generous in their comments. And I told them something that I'd like to share with you. And that was one thing Derek was concerned about because his style of pedagogy was so involved and so student focused, was that it might cease upon his death. Well, it certainly did not. And I've been to a number of memorial services, uh, with a lecture series and what have you. I've started a couple um, since his death. But I have to say that this event is very special 
It is a signature event. You have set a standard, a new standard for this. And I, and I really want us to acknowledge that now by having people at different levels of their scholarship and their career, by covering the broad areas of Derek's life, his scholarship, you know, his pedagogy, his activism, his true love of learning and love of students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. So I have the pleasure of introducing Ian Haney Lopez. I'll keep it short because I want to hear from him. I also think that I may be a bit starstruck, so I, I need to uh, move forth here. So Ian Haney Lopez is the John H. Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he has uh, visited at all of the most prestigious um, schools, um, Yale, Harvard, New York University, and today he's here with us, so, so I think that's wonderful as well. He's really one of the nation's leading thinkers about race and racism, and I, I always uh, have my students in Race and the Law begin by reading The Social Construction of Race. Um, some observations and illusions, fabrication, and they are, their minds are blown um, each and every time. They look at race, they look at racism different after that. Today he will be speaking about his new book, Dog Whistle Politics, How 50 Years of Race Baiting um, Wrecked the Middle Class. Um, presently available under um, Oxford University Press, and also to reflect on the influence of Derrick Bell. So without any more delay, um, please join me in welcoming him. We are so honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all. It'll be just one second as I get myself organized technologically. One second's ambitious. Is that working? Not yet. Ah, uh, yes. Perfect, and I like I liked the way it resolved slowly into the cover of the book. Very impressive. Okay, so um, uh, thank you all for, for, for being here. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm tremendously honored uh, to speak on this occasion. It's always wonderful to speak uh, in honor of Derek Bell. Um, and talking about my book in this context is especially appropriate this book would not exist but for an invitation by Derek Bell. Uh, Professor Bell invited me to give, it was about three years ago, this spring, 2011, invited me to give a lecture, uh, the, the Bell Lecture on Race, Law, and Society. And I was then in the midst of a project thinking about what had happened to equal protection law uh, basically uh, since the civil rights era. And so I resolved to give that talk uh, as the Bell Lecture. But in working on this project, you know, I'd come to the conclusion that I think a lot of you share that if you look at equal protection now, it suffered a, a very a, a perverse reversal, such that contemporary equal protection offers virtually no protection to minorities. Um, effectively, since the court adopted a malice test, a malice understanding of intent, uh, in 1979, it has never found discrimination against minorities. On the other hand, uh, since about that same era, in affirmative action case after affirmative action case, it has consistently found discrimination against whites. But I didn't want to give a lecture simply detailing that doctrine, because the more I'd studied it, and I'd spent years engaged with and trying to make sense of the doctrine, uh, the more I'd studied it, the more I realized the story wasn't a doctrinal story. That it was really something different. It was a story about what had happened in American politics. It was a story about the way in which the civil rights movement created a racial backlash against whites that Republican uh, politicians decided to take advantage of. Um, not just to take advantage of some naturally occurring backlash, but to stoke it, to stimulate it, to give it form, and to repeatedly give it new life. And in the process, uh, to win, uh, to, to break a New Deal coalition and to win support from whites. And this politics was incredibly successful. 
After 1964, no Democratic presidential candidate has won a majority of the white vote. Uh, uh, not once. Not since 1964. And if you want to understand the success of this, what I'm going to call dog whistle politics, um, look at the Republican Party today. It draws 9 out of 10 supporters from among whites. 98% of its elected state officials are white. This is a party that has largely defined itself in terms of race. And what I, t what I talked about at the Bell Lectures, I said, look, the conservative justices on the court, right, and these are a series of five, four decisions that have, that have destroyed equal protection. Those conservative justices were put on the court by presidents who campaigned under the theme that whites were the real victims of racial discrimination in our society. And also under the theme that minorities were the biggest threat that most whites face in their lives. So that it should be no surprise that if that's the politics of the president who appointed them, that the justices should reveal that politics in their decisions in a series of decisions that didn't find discrimination against minorities who are now understood uh, uh, not as victims but as the greatest threat in American life. And also that these same justices should find over and over and over again that the real victims of discrimination in American life today are whites. Right? And so that was the story I told in the Bell Lecture. There was a publisher uh, in the audience. Uh, I met with the publisher soon thereafter, and the publisher said, you got to do this as a book. And I said, I'm not crazy. Uh, there's no way I'm going to write a book that covers 50 years of American politics that draws on history, that draws on political science, draws on sociology, draws on um, uh, psychology, and that also tries to detail what happened with all these cases. And she says, no, skip the cases. Law's boring. Now, professionally, I was required to take umbrage at that. But then she said something else. She said, do this in 70 pages. And I said, 70 pages? This is a thousand page project. I'm looking at David Garrow. This is a thousand page project, right? I, I don't have the fortitude to do it. And she says, do it in 70 pages. Because if you do it in 70 pages, you sketch the arguments. You don't really need to amass a whole lot of evidence. You set the terms of the debate, and then other people can go debate it. And I thought to myself, shoot, 70 pages. I've written footnotes longer than 70 pages. <laughs> right? And I know you're laughing, but some of you law professors out there, you know I'm not joking. Right. OK, so I thought, yeah, I'll do this, right? 70 pages, this is going to be great, I, no, no problem. So uh, uh, taught during the spring term of 2012, um, uh, took a six-week vacation in Europe, Spain, Morocco, wonderful, came back late July of 2012, and I said, 70 pages, here I go. What a disaster. I was like, oh, my, I couldn't believe it. Threw myself into this uh, in incredible project. Um, ended up writing 500 pages, uh, which were completely unreadable. Slashed it back down. So now it's you know a little bit over 200 or something like that. But it has been an intense, crazy project. I'm going to describe it to you in a second. Here's the key that I learned, though, in writing this. And I want to just break this out. The story I told at the Bell Lecture was really a story about um, uh, the way in which conservatives had used race to win votes. And that's right. But what I didn't fully appreciate was that it wasn't just about winning votes. It was about a war on the New Deal. It was about using race not simply, and, in, and indeed not primarily, to demonize minorities, but instead principally primarily to demonize liberal government. And what I came to understand is there are two striking phenomena that we tend to think of as disconnected but instead are intimately connected. We now have one political party that is defined essentially by race. And then on the other hand, we have levels of wealth inequality we haven't seen in a century. We had the Great Recession. Uh, we had um, uh, job losses, jobs that have never come back, stagnation in our economy, um, uh, people have lost their, their, their home equity, people are really struggling, and these two things are connected. Conservative politicians have been using race, not just to demonize minorities, but to tarnish liberal government and to conduct a war on the New Deal in the service of the interests of the richest 
corporations, the richest individuals, the richest families in America. And so that's the story that I tell in Dog Whistle Politics. I'm going to run through it very quickly, and then I'm going to circle back um, to my relationship with, with Bell because there's a, way in, there's a poignant story here that I want to make sure I get to. Okay. Some people recognize Barry Goldwater, All right? So, a hundred years ago, Robert Barron's Standard Oil, DuPont, they had control of society, they had control of government. Um, uh, roaring Twenties, financial collapse, Great Depression. Long, slow recovery. Maybe you recognize the arc, okay? We then moved as a society into what we call now the New Deal, but what's the New Deal? The New Deal is this. It's a very simple proposition. Government must set the rules for the marketplace. Government must set the rules for society. When it does so, who should it favor? Should it favor the very rich? Or should it favor the great bulk of Americans? And the New Deal settled that question by saying, and, and you wouldn't think that this was all this innovative, but it was quite radical. Government should set the rules of the marketplace and of society in ways that favor the great mass of Americans. Right. And this was New Deal liberalism. Um, I, I, I can say a bunch more about it, but I'll just leave it there. I, I, other than to say, under New Deal liberalism, the country saw the greatest expansion of the middle class the world has ever seen. And yet, there was a set of people who were opposed to New Deal. And they were opposed to it in particular because they wanted two things. They wanted low taxes. And that meant they didn't want a government that provided services, that sought to help people out, that invested in infrastructure or in education or provided a safety net. Right? They wanted low taxes and that meant they wanted a minimal government. They also wanted control over government, especially control over the regulatory apparatus of the state. We tend to think of these very rich, conservative, sort of anti-government people as if they are anti-government. They're not actually anti-government. They're pro-government, so long as they control it. Because it's through control of government that they win most of their most lucrative contracts, that they help establish through government rules monopolies that protects them from competition. So there's a set of plutocrats who want control over government, want control over the regulatory apparatus of government, and they want very low taxes. And if that means cutting social services, they're good with it because, hey, they're rich. Right? And that's symbolized by Barry Goldwater. 1964. He's running for president. He's the last of the sort of um, uh, plutocratic uh, uh, warriors, opponents of the New Deal. Now, I have two pictures of him. Um, one of him is dressed as a senator. He's a senator from Arizona. The other is him in his cowboy getup. Now, he's a scion of a wealthy retail family in Arizona, but he fancied himself a cowboy. And this wasn't just sartorial. This was ideological. Because for him, the, the, uh, the ideal was the rugged individual who, d who depended on nobody, um, who needed help from nobody, who took care of himself or herself, that is, who needed no help from government and who was willing to compete in the marketplace, to rise and succeed if possible, or fail and die quietly otherwise. Right? And that was the ideal. So this, is, so this was Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater understood, though, that the New Deal had pulled America out of the Great Re Recession that was still clearly in the, in the uh, Great Depression, sorry, clearly in the rearview mirror, understood that the New Deal was immensely popular, understood that he was not going to win simply by campaigning against the New Deal. So he made a fateful decision. He and other leaders of the Republican Party, they would turn to race. At this point, though, the nation had changed because of the Civil Rights Movement. You could not now nakedly appeal for white solidarity. And so instead, Goldwater and the Republican Party moved to coded language. Language that on its surface had nothing to do with race, but that underneath clearly communicated a racial message. Examples, states' rights. Barry Goldwater began to campaign for states' rights, as if the issue was state-federal relations. But everybody understood at the time that states' rights meant the right of southern states to resist integration in its schools and in its society. Or Barry Goldwater would campaign on the basis of freedom of association, as if this were a sort of um, uh, abstruse liberty interest in who we relate to. When everybody understood at the time, freedom of association meant the freedom of white-owned businesses to exclude African Americans. Right? So these are the themes that he used. And also he campaigned against the New Deal. How did he do? 
he was crushed. Right? He was running against Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson at this time is campaigning in favor of a war on poverty that, it, that promises an expansion of the New Deal um, uh, and also a push for racial justice. And Barry Goldwater is absolutely crushed. And many people conclude that the New Deal is now um, uh, untouchable, that it is now consensus, that it has now solidified its position as the normal logic of American politics. Except there's a warning rising in the South. Right? Goldwater may have lost all across the country, but he won in Arizona, his home state, and he won in five deep South states, outright. He won a majority of the white vote in 10 Southern states. And this is insane. The South. The South hates Republicans. They hate Republicans. They associate white Southerners, associate the Republican Party with instigating the Civil War. And even more immediately, they associate the, the, the Republican Party with Brown versus Board of Education. After all, it's a Republican, an ex-Republican governor, Earl Warren, um, who writes Brown versus Board of Education. And it's a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, who first orders Southern troops into the federal troops into the South to force integration. The South, they hate Republicans, Southern whites. And they love the New Deal. The South, even more than the North, was economically destroyed by the Great Depression. For many in the South, electricity didn't come to them first until the New Deal. These are ardent supporters of the New Deal, and yet, when a Republican opponent of the New Deal comes to them and asks for their votes using the language of states' rights and freedom of association, they vote for him. And here's the warning. Even the most ardent Democrats, the strongest supporters of the New Deal, can be convinced to vote Republican, to vote against the New Deal, if they are appealed to in racial terms. Would this work? Richard Nixon wasn't sure. He wasn't sure. Goldwater had been crushed across the country. So when Nixon runs in 1968, he runs initially as a, a moderate. He's a moderate Republican. Except that late in the election, he's being flanked on his right by an independent candidate, George Wallace. And Nixon begins to think that he needs to pick up some of George Wallace's racial vote. And so, Nixon, too, comes out in favor of slowing integration in the South. Nixon wins election, but barely. And it's not clear if race baiting has helped him or not. But within a couple of years, Republican and Democratic strategists have crunched the numbers, and they've come back with this news. Yes, Republicans can break the New Deal coalition of Northeastern uh, elites, of the white working class, of Southern blacks, uh, uh, sorry, of blacks and of Southern whites, if they use racial appeals. And Nixon seizes on this, this new common sense. And in his re-election campaign in 1972, he runs in favor of states' rights in the South, and he runs in favor of what he calls, or, or as an opponent of what he calls, forced busing in the North. Now, forced busing, it's another dog whistle. It suggests that the issue is putting school children on buses. But everybody understands that it's really in a way of expressing opposition to the integration that busing children was supposed to achieve. He wins in a landslide. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson, as an ardent supporter of the New Deal, wins 67% of the white vote. In 1972, Richard Nixon, coming out in favor of states' rights and against forced busing, wins 70% of the white vote. And this marks this crucial shift, this, this sea change, where all of a sudden now Republicans understand. It's just, it couldn't be more clear. If they use race, they can win and win and win. But remember, Nixon was a moderate in his policies. It's this man who really combines the two most devastating elements of dog whistle politics. Not only the use of race, but also its use of race tied to hostility towards the New Deal. 
This is a picture of uh, Ronald Reagan. This is where he opened his campaign. This is the Neshoba County Fair in Philadelphia, Mississippi. R Reagan has just secured the Republican nomination for president. This is his first official campaign stop as the Republican nominee. Neshoba County is infamous because 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers there had been kidnapped and lynched. Their bodies found months later. There wasn't a voter alive in Neshoba County in 1980 when Ronald Reagan goes there to begin his campaign who hadn't been alive when these three civil rights workers were kidnapped and lynched. And what does Ronald Reagan promise? Support for states' rights. He's using that old language. But Reagan wasn't simply appealing on the basis of race. He was, also a, he was also a Goldwater Republican. Indeed, he got his start in politics uh, as, a, as, a sort of, as, a, as a supporter of Goldwater. I want to tell a story that Reagan used to tell. Reagan used to tell audiences about um, it, it, that he shared their frustration. He understood their anger when they're standing in line waiting to buy hamburger. And some young fellow ahead of them is buying a T-bone steak with food stamps. Now, the racial element. When he first told the story, he said some young buck, right? A southern term uh, for a strong black man, uh, uh, one uh, resistant to white authority. He was telling a story that welfare is being abused by young black men, not just who are lazy, but who are strong and lazy and refused to work when they could and preferred instead to scam society. That's the imagery that he's using. That's one character. There's another implicit character, the you that he was talking to. The you is implicitly the white taxpayer. He was saying, I know you, you're hard working, you play by the rules, you're struggling, and because you play by the rules and you're struggling, you're working hard, all you can afford is hamburger when someone else is getting, getting over on you, ripping you off, living high off the hawk, right? So it's the you. But there's another character here, and it was government. And this was Reagan's main point. It was government. It was government that was reaching its hands into the pocket of the white taxpayer and taking their hard-earned dollar and giving it to these lazy, scheming, scamming minorities. Right? And so what Reagan said is, hey, you want to you, you end this? Vote for tax cuts. You need tax cuts. You ought to stop paying your taxes, which are just getting taken from you and given to these lazy, no-good minorities. And so people voted for massive tax cuts. But did the middle class benefit from those tax cuts? In the 1980s, the Reagan tax cuts transferred a trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1% of Americans. A trillion dollars. And they've transferred a further trillion dollars of wealth to the top 1% of Americans every decade thereafter. And that's the story of dog whistle politics. Or maybe we see the story this way. Think about a fourth character, the cashier. Who was the cashier in the late 70s, late in early 1980s? She, was pro she, had, she had a good chance of being unionized. She had a decent salary, it was a respectable job, uh, good benefits, right? Enough money that you could support a family. Who's the cashier now in 2014? Almost, uh, uh, very unlikely to be unionized working for a minimum wage that hasn't kept pace with inflation, working for a minimum wage that cannot support a small family. And indeed, if you look at what's happening with Walmart employees, it's the cashier who herself is likely to be on food stamps. That's dog whistle politics. The rich, the 1%, are getting trillions. And people who are working are on food stamps and being demonized for it. Right? That's dog whistle politics. I'm going to skip all the way to the present. Mitt Romney, this was one of the campaign slogans. Subtle. Obama isn't working. <laughs> this, is, this is a Romney campaign commercial. It's not just a Romney campaign commercial. This is a commercial on which he spent half his advertising budget. Right? This, is, this is the commercial on which he spent half his advertising budget. Sorry, I'm going to hold for one second. Can we? I wonder if we can. It turns out that the volume that, that helps. <laughs> okay. 
I know it's just a little knob. Yeah, that's all. All right, cool. I'm going to seize this opportunity and have a swallow water. In 1996, President Clinton Another knob. Bipartisan Congress helped in welfare as well. For welfare. But on July 12th, President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform by dropping its requirements under Obama's plan. No, I think you found the volume for the mic up here. Train for a job. They just sent you your welfare check. And welfare to work goes back to being plain welfare. That's okay. That's okay. Maybe just turn that down. We're getting some feedback. I'm going to stop there. I think, I think you folks have a sense of this commercial. Maybe you remember it. This is where Romney picks up on a slight change in, the, in, in welfare regulations to say that under Obama, welfare to work is going to go, is, is, uh, that there will no longer be any need to work and that welfare to work is going to be, go back to just being plain old welfare and they just send you your check, right? So this is, now, we should be clear, the factual predicate for this is fraudulent. This is not what Obama did. This is not what his administration did. Um, in fact, PolitiFact responds to this ad by giving Romney a pants on fire uh, label. Um, uh, to which, I, I don't know if you remember this classic moment, a, a Romney campaign spokesperson says, we will not let our campaign be dictated by the facts. <laughs> right? And it was a classic moment. It was like this, you know, this sort of crystallization of the truth of modern political campaigning. Facts? No. Frames. It's all about frames. And what's the frame? The frame is, this is a Democrat who's taking us back to what the Democrats always do, which is they're taking government and they're giving it over to minorities. They're taking your hard-earned money and they're just giving it to minorities who aren't even going to work. They're just going to get their check. Except that the frame is more potent. Right? Because the story that Reagan was telling was a story in which government coddles minorities. The story that Romney is telling you is not only does government coddle minorities, but government is minorities. This is government for and by minorities. When you vote Democrat, you get a government that's for and by minorities, right? Half, half his campaign budget on an ad that was, as factual matter, false. But as a frame, pure dog whistle politics. Now, I have another clip here. I, I, won't, I won't play it, because um, um, you won't hear it. Um, um, this is Mitt Romney, where he says, 47% of the country um, don't pay income taxes. He doesn't need to worry about them. These are people who refuse to take responsibility for themselves, who feel entitled to things like health care and homes and, and education, um, uh, who will never be responsible for themselves, uh, who he can't appeal to, and so his job is not to worry about them. He's going to worry about th the rest of the Americas. The rest of the Americas. Is this dog whistle politics? That, that, that frame, is that dog whistle politics? On one level, you want to say, no, how can it be? He's, he's dismissing 47% of the country. He's dismissing half the country. That's not just minorities anymore. On the other hand, think about the language he's using. It's a language of entitlement, of dependency, of a lack of responsibility. Those are the words that are used to describe minorities. And what Republicans have done is they've taken that language and they've, and they've darkened all people who seek help, social assistance, all poor people who seek social assistance from government, right? So this, it's, it's not, the way, the way in which minorities have been demonized hasn't been limited to minorities. All the poor have been racialized as minorities. But even more fundamentally, this is dog whistle politics in that Goldwater sense. This is insane as a social vision. What candidate would run for office saying, I don't have to care about half the country? Half the country don't deserve our care. They don't des they, we don't need to regard them as kin to us, as part of our society. We can just dismiss them and move on and focus on the top half. Who would say that? Well, I mean, what kind of a sick social vision is that? It's a gold water right, rugged individual, cowboy, if you make it great, if you don't, please go off and die quietly, kind of a social vision. 
right? And nobody's going to vote for that. Well, this was 1972, right? Nobody's going to vote for that because you all are saying Romney lost. Not among whites. This is what 2012 looks like if only white votes had counted. Romney won 60% of the white vote. And you might say, okay, what's well, a southern phenomena? No, this is not just a southern phenomena. You might say it's among men. No, he won among a majority of white women too. You might say, well, at least the youth. No, Romney won a majority of the white vote in every age cohort of whites, including the very youngest. This cruel, plutocratic vision of government is strongly supported by a majority of whites all across the country, across genders, and across age brackets. This is, and, and, and let me say, Romney won a margin among white voters that we haven't seen except in Nixon's re-election in 1972 and in Ronald Reagan's re-election in 1984. So it's not like there's this declining line and this is all going away, no. Right? And then Gallup just came out with an article a week ago saying white support for Republicans solidifying. This is the reality we're living with today. We are living under a political system in which the Republican Party has successfully, and today successfully still, uses race as a way to tell a majority of whites, fear minorities and fear government. Don't worry about the plutocrats. Don't worry about surging levels of wealth inequality. Don't worry about your jobs. Don't worry about your pensions. And certainly, don't look to unions for support. They're evil too. Instead, fear minorities, fear liberal government. This is what we're living with, though, right? Okay. So this is the book. This is the story I'm telling. Let me bring it back to Derek Bell. Um, as I said, there's, there, there's, a, there's a poignant element here. Um, I'm going to read to you a bit. This is from the preface of the book. Um, I know reading is a faux pas in a public lecture, um, but I think it's important that th- th- this is, I want you to understand, this is how I frame the book. I had the enviable opportunity to study with Bell in the late 80s and early 90s at the start of my own lifelong intellectual engagement with race and racism in the United States. This is not to say that I was close to Bell during my student days or that I stayed in contact with him over the last two decades. On the contrary, I had hoped to use the lecture in his honor to finally fully repair a strained relationship. Over just the past few years, I had been able to reconnect with Bell, and we'd even joked about my having been a difficult student in one of the last courses he taught while still at Harvard. But we had never discussed the source of the estrangement, an estrangement so deep that mid-semester I simply stopped attending class. That long ago conflict bears directly on my argument in the pages that follow. Bell taught his course through weekly engagement with chapters from a book he was then writing, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. The crux was the subtitle. I thought then and until the last several years that Bell's central claim that there had been little genuine progress in American race relations was silly, even absurd. Bell explained his thesis thus, black people will never gain full equality in this country, even those Herculean efforts we hail as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. The end of slavery and of Jim Crow segregation were merely temporary peaks of progress sliding into irrelevance? The claim seemed ridiculous. To explain away his thesis, I focus not on its substance, but instead on Bell's psychology. He was then in a particularly challenging place. His beloved wife, Jewel, was dying of cancer. And as if that wasn't enough, two decades after becoming the first tenured black professor at Harvard Law, he was in the midst of protesting that school's insistence, year after year, that no woman of color qualified to serve on its august faculty. True to his background as a civil rights leader and activist, Bell had taken an unpaid leave of absence to pressure the institution, and we students staged rallies in support. The school administration responded by demanding that Bell return to full-time teaching or resign his tenured professorship. He resigned. I thought then that he was at a bitter point in his life, infecting his insights and his pedagogy. In retrospect, it was my mindset that mattered more. 
Young and liberal, I burned with impatience, emboldened by an arc of history bends toward justice certainty about the world. I didn't have much tolerance for deep pessimism. Plus, my own biography suggested that Bell was wrong. I grew up in Hawaii as a biracial kid, white and Latino. Rarely encountering the racially pejorative views more common on the mainland, I learned to move easily among different groups. Also, I was privileged, not to the degree of most of my peers at HLS, to be sure, but after all, wasn't I there walking its hallowed halls and studying its storied classrooms? Wasn't my life, and indeed even Bell's Harvard professorship, proof positive that at least some progress had been made? Clear evidence that the civil rights movement, though it hadn't achieved nearly enough, still had moved the country forward. I viscerally rejected Bell's dismal analysis, for it assaulted my confidence in the moral universe and drew into question the meaning and security of my own position. Things came to a head the week we debated Bell's space trader allegory. Suppose, he said, aliens arrive from space and offer America riches to solve the debt problem, new technology to heal the environment, and a steady source of clean energy. In return, though, they ask for the nation's entire black population, and re-enslavement seems likely. Would America accept? I raised my hand and said no, unable to countenance a future for myself in a society still capable of selling blacks into slavery. The country would not again reduce people to property, not in the present, I protested. I remember distinctly Bell's rejoinder, mocking my pie-in-the-sky optimism. He argued that in many ways, metaphorically, the United States has often sold non-whites down the river to achieve short-term and short-sighted benefits for whites. Other students piped up to support his dire analysis. I fumed. I thought they were all playing at being radicals with their unfairly biting attacks on a society that had already given me, us, so much. After that class discouraged and upset, I left the course and did not return. On a personal level, I now wince at my misplaced certitude and also lament squandering the chance to continue to learn from the best thinker on race and law in a tumultuous era. I also keenly regret never having taken a moment to talk about all of this with Professor Bell, to seek some sort of closure on this faded conflict. But most especially, I'm sorry that my former professor did not live long enough to join me in rueful laughter following the lecture in his, in his honor. After all, in that lecture, I explained how I reluct reluctantly came to conclude that he was correct all along about the permanence of racism. My mistake had been to think that permanent meant fixed and unchanging. It did not. Rather, the key lay plainly visible in another phrase within Bell's thesis. Short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. Racial patterns adapt, or to switch from the passive voice, strategic individuals adapt race. Dog whistle politics explains how politicians, backed by concentrated wealth, manipulate racial appeals to win elections and also to win support for regressive policies that help corporations and the super rich, and in the process, wreck the middle class. The book lays out the details. For now, though, the bottom line is that Professor Bell was correct. Racism is not disappearing, it's adapting. Someday, I fervently hope to say, as the result of open-minded and careful analysis rather than self-protecting, self-deluding anger, that Bell has been proven wrong, that racism is no longer surreptitiously adapting, but genuinely over. Today, though, that day seems further off even than it did two decades ago when a young student precipitously abandoned Bell rather than confront a painful truth about our society and our future. So in honor of Derek Bell then, who taught us so much and from whom we have so much more to learn. Thank you all. I, I'm happy to take questions, but not at the cost of, of delaying dinner. So I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> I, I just thought perhaps we could spend uh, five minutes with, with questions, and then um, just a couple minutes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I guess at the cost of delaying dinner then, I'm, please bear with me. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so if you haven't yet read uh, uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, it's an absolute must read and I would say, in fact do say in chapter two, what has happened with racialized mass incarceration is a perfect example of dog whistle politics in operation. Politicians started competing, uh, st started demonizing minorities through the coded language of law and order and crime. Those slogans did not stay on the campaign trails. They quickly translated into legislation and that, and that legislation has created a system of racialized mass incarceration the world has never seen before. With 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's prisoners. And it, you cannot understand uh, uh, racialized mass incarceration except in the way in which crime became a proxy language for minorities. Uh, by the way, you can't understand the way in which we shifted also from a model of rehabilitation to a model of punishment. Right? Prior to this rise of the new carceral state, we had a sense that prisoners were us. That, that, that um, people made mistakes, um, uh, uh, some people uh, poor choices, but in the end, uh, people get through it, you can educate them, you can bring them back, you've got to reintegrate them. We lost that sense when we began to see prisoners as minorities. And so this, the punitive regime, the rise of solitary confinement, all of this is, is related to a sense that crime is being used as a proxy language for minorities. Oh wait, sorry, I saw it uh, up here. Go ahead. Yes. Wait, I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch that. Could you could you say that last part again? I mean, a little bit louder. Though. I, I just. <laughs> yeah. I, so, so, you know, there, I think there are a couple of dynamics here. O on the one hand, it's really remarkable that o Obama won the support of 40% of whites. Th and and we, ought, we ought to understand that this signals a, a remarkable moment in the history of race in the United States, that, that a black man was elected and re-elected. That's really a, 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 a sort of a watershed moment. At the same time, it's a warning that race evolves. It doesn't stay in, 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 in the same way. That, that race works now not in a hate every black person way, um, but rather in a shifting discourse that often focuses on uh, uh, culture and comportment. This helped make Barack Obama palatable to a lot of whites. Um, many whites who, even if they support Obama, nevertheless tend to be sympathetic to these stories of minorities as threatening them. And then, of course, there's the 60% of whites um, uh, who did not vote for him. Now, uh, it, it's not all about race, of course, um, but race is one of the more powerful elements here. And I, I, I think it's important to say, the people voting against Obama, they are not racist. Um, they would certainly not understand themselves as racist. They would genuinely insist that they are not racist, that they believe in, in racial egalitarianism, that they're for square, uh, uh, for racial justice against white supremacy. But the, ra the way race works now, these narratives of minorities as criminals, or one of the things that I, I don't talk about, or, or that I talk about in the book that I didn't in the lecture, is think about all the rhetoric about illegal aliens. We say of illegal aliens, they're criminally disposed, um, um, uh, they're connected with terrorism, they're connected with drug cartels, um, they're connected with disease, with filth, with a degraded culture. You couldn't say that if you were using the word spick. But if you replace spick with illegal alien, you can say all of it, 
right? And it makes sense to a lot of people for whom that, the, all of that heated rhetoric about illegal aliens uh, seems unproblematic and, and seems true, they would act, absolutely be repulsed if they understood that it was racial, right? So it's a remarkable moment um, that, that Obama has been elected and reelected. But it also tells us, watch how race adapts. And it adapts in a way that focuses on culture and comportment. And many of the old stereotypes have simply been refurbished and applied now in seemingly race neutral terms. Welfare cheat, gang banger, uh, Sharia law, illegal alien, food stamp recipient. None of these references race on its surface. And yet all of them triggers the same ugly stereotypes. Oh, awesome. Sorry, oh, wait, sorry. Yes, go ahead. You'll want to repeat that. Oh, that not the first part, that, that second clause. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, <laughs> focus your presentation on how Republicans start versus politics. But I wanted to the point where you have an example of how Democrats. Absolutely. Perfect. Or even when Ronnie Kurt, what's his last name? Guineer? Guineer was going to the confirmation process with. Objective. Yeah, I think that, so, so fantastic question. You might have picked up in Romney's ad, he's celebrating welfare to work and he starts with a photo of Bill Clinton. We should be very clear. Democrats have responded in, in, in two ways, largely, to dog was a politics. One is to simply ignore it, to, to feel like, okay, Republicans are using race against us. If we just stay silent and don't talk about race, this has got to go away. And, and partly they're thinking to themselves, it's going to go away because this is just bigotry and eventually the bigots are going to die out. Right? And, they, and, you know, and there's, a, there's a new book uh, out by a couple of uh, Democratic uh, demographers that say the future is ours. It's the same argument. Bigots are going to die eventually and everything's going to be fine. We should just not talk about race until then. Right? No, that completely misunderstands a phenomena. It's continually being reinvented, and that's why the, that's why there's levels of support for Romney that even even George W. Bush didn't achieve. Right? Okay, so that's one response. Ignore it. Hopefully, it'll go away. The other response is adopt it, adopt dog whistle tactics, and that's what Bill Clinton did. Bill Clinton came out and he said, I'm a new Democrat. What does a new Democrat mean? He said, I'm going to be tough on crime and I'm going to, I love this phrase, he would say, I'm going to end welfare as a way of life. And who, do you, who did the audience understand him to be talking about, right? It, 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 and so even Clinton didn't win a majority of the white vote, but he came very, very close and it allowed him to get elected. So Democrats have absolutely used this. But I want to be clear, this is not a story of Democrat and Republican. Indeed, it's not, I mean, it's not even really a story of Republicans. This is a story of conservatism, of the plutocratic fringe of the Republican Party that since 1964 has been waging a consistent series of campaigns against more, more mainstream Republicans. And we're seeing the same dynamic now. Um, Barack Obama was saying after he won re-election that his politics are actually akin to Ronald Reagan's politics. And, and I think that's right. The, the Democratic Party has shifted right. But the Republican Party has gone to an extreme. I mean, Reagan's politics now would be voted out of office, would, would, be, would be tarred by the sort of Tea Party rhetoric. This is an extreme sort of politics that uses demagoguery, that uses this sort of uh, race baiting, but continually ties it to a politics of helping people like the Koch brothers. And it, so it's, and, and if we say, well, Democrats do it too, we, yeah, they do, but the main point is conservatives have used this to turn the United States or to turn a significant portion of the white electorate against the basic premise of New Deal government, which is government should take care of the majority in society. And, we, and, and, and it's really important that we don't lose sight of that phenomenon. Okay. I wish we could continue this conversation. Um, and you know what? We can because we're beginning again tomorrow. So I want you all to join me in thanking Professor Ian Hill. Thank you all.
absolutely wonderful. So tomorrow, um, registration and continental breakfast begins at 8 a.m. All events will be at the University Club. We're going to start with opening remarks at 8.30 and our first panel at 9. It's going to go throughout the day. I invite you to look at the program and see the richness of offerings. and. Let's continue um, this discussion. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. On your way out, if you could leave your, your name tag and then come get it tomorrow. We're, we're, we're being green and so uh, we didn't want to print out too. So thank you.